Hello, good morning, and welcome back to the Fish Locker out on the boat. I'm joined today by my friend Dan. Morning. On this wonderful morning, we we're just talking about it's definitely the best time of day. The plan is that we've just been watching a deer walk along the shore side. There. The plan today is that we're going to be going. We're going to be going a long way. We're going to be going a bit of fishing on a reef, and then the tide drops slack. We might pop up to a wreck and see if there's any ling around. That is the rough plan. What well, the first order of day is, we need to try and find some mackerel for bait. Let's go. Yeah, sand eels and mackerel if you can, please. If I can, okay. if I can order them. Right, the fish are about 20 metres. That's when you're going to start eating the mackerel. That's all good. Told you? Yeah. Right. Steady away. It's, it's a sensitive rod, so it should take out all the. Lovely. You've killed quite a lot. We're looking around in the water and we can see on the sounder that there's just clouds and clouds of little tiny sprats. If you can get down to like 25 metres, that's where the mackerel are. But it's getting through the sand eels. If it's just sand eels, we'll go somewhere else. Because there's no point, there's no point catching what we can't use. All we're getting round here is loads and loads of sand eels and there's, uh, there's no point catching them. So we're going to try and find some mackerel. Do a little bit of lure fishing. Now one of the things that, one of the things I've mentioned in quite a lot of other videos is reading the signs for what's going on. Now one of the great signs for following fish is the birds. And I don't know if you can see over here, but we have probably a hundred seagulls. And you can hear them as well, they're all on, they're all skittish on the water, they're feeding. And that's because there is a lot of little tiny sprats in the water and something beneath them is forcing the sprats up to the surface. So you've probably got bass and mackerel forcing the sprats up to the surface and the seagulls are taking them from above. So yeah, that's a great sign. Take it. It's not the bass I wanted, but I'll take it. See him chasing it. I'm glad we take an apple though. <laughs> Try letting it sink into the sand. It's not, like, not up on surface anymore. We can't see him breaking up the surface can we? I don't mind catching mackerel like that because that's brilliant bait for when we go out to the wrecks. The mackerel? It's real in it, aren't we? We love it. Unfortunately, we're facing directly into the sun there, so I'll turn you a little bit on the side. Yeah. You go find one? A little micro pollock. They're stunning when they're small, aren't they? Because they're, when they're living right in kelp, they're almost like a golden ginger. Drop the mackerel back at board. Yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, still. Ah, oh, little baby pollock. I think we'll go somewhere else. Brought us to a new area reef now. All it is, it's, it's just up and down, and we're going to run a long drift, well, hopefully, run a long drift along it. We are drifting along quite slowly, because the tide is just dropping away to slack. And all we're doing is I'm fishing, this is a new setup. This is a conflict tie rubber rod. It's, it's a really nice little rippy rod, and it's a fathom low profile. And I'm just fishing with, I think this is a 30 gram speed jig. We're fishing for anything that we can catch. Pollock, bass, wrasse, mackerel, anything, just a bit of sport in here. 
and then we're going to run off and we're going to use some of the fresh mackerel on one of the wrecks offshore. Just dropping all the way at the bottom. The first, I was just explaining to Dan there, the first couple of casts, I always just experiment. Like, I'll try one where I cast it to distance and bring it in high along the surface. Next one, I'll let it sink a little bit more. Then I'll place some along the bottom just to experiment to see where the fish are and to see what they're after. Now on the way down, we did see an awful lot of feed, a lot of, a lot of little tiny sprats in the water. So we are using small lures. There's no point presenting like a six, eight inch lure when the fish are used to eating two inch long fish. It's a beautiful volume mass. What a donkey! <laughs> the colours underneath it are incredible as well, aren't they? Yeah, that's that's the best part of a I'll give it a good four pound balling rest. I might stick this back in there and I might go a photo. There he is swimming back down to the oh, you just missed him there. Oh. Yeah, I'd say <laughs> I had that ras sat in net and I thought oh, I'll just keep him in net for a couple of seconds and I'll show you releasing him and then I'd forgotten that I've got a big hole in my net so yeah it's comes it's gone through the hole in the net and he's been released. But yeah that was a cracker there. It was, um, of the wrasse we're getting our air we were just talking about, and then that, that's a ballon wrasse. They're like the dogs of the reef. They're, they're, that guy there was probably 20 years old. They do, they do get bigger. They do get to being like eight, nine pounds. That's the max, that's the record. Like that guy there was, was four and a half. And that was just on a little speed jig on my, uh, yeah, little tie rubber. It is uh, max 20 pound. I'd say I, I don't really go by PE rating. But this is a PE 0.8 to 1.5. You on? Don't force it, enjoy it. You got a pollock? Mackerel. Mackerel. Yeah, Ballon Ras, they are, oh, ooh. Ballon Ras are edible, but they aren't really, it's not really encouraged that you would take them for the table because they're incredibly slow growing. And also they're a very important part of the local marine ecosystem, being that they keep down the, oh, he's a chunky map one. Tell you what, that is a good one, that one. I think that one will be coming home for dinner. You want an invite for dinner, son? They, uh, yeah, they uh, they eat a lot of the marine parasites. So you'll see sometimes that when we bring pollock up, and they'll have lice on them. And the rats go around eating all the lice. In fact, there is, there is an industry down here in Cornwall where the commercial fishermen catch rats, keep them alive. And they sell them to the, the salmon farms in Scotland because it's an eco friendly of keeping the parasites down in the salmon farms. You are kidding me, honestly. Ooh! I've got a feeling that's another balance. 
Can't bully it. <laughs> More like a noodle of a rod, I can't bully it. Oh, where were we? 12 metres. To be honest, mate, the reason why I don't publicise my birthday is because I forget what it is half the time. Oh. Hannah has to remind me. I'll tell you what, this guy's been in wars, he's got a couple of scars on him. Yeah, this guy really has been in the wars. Something, I think, probably a seal. Has had hold of this guy's tail. He's got some wounds on this side as well. There he goes. We're fishing to features, we're fishing on reef, we're fishing on pinnacles, we're fishing on rocks. Because that's that's the areas, like the weed and the kelp and the rocks and everything, where these fish, not only did they find refuge and they hide, but also their food sources. Are... Tell you what, it's that's great, broad, isn't it? great fun. <laughs> It's about matching, matching the tackle to the fish that you're likely to be catching. I mean, we're we're unlikely to be catching any like monster double figure pollock today. We might get might get some up in the eights and the nines, but most of them are going to be this stamp. They're going to be four, five, six pound fish. There's no point going too heavy. when you see me releasing fish when all their fins are up like that when they're still tense when they're ready to go if you just torpedo them in head first it gives them like a bit of a kick start to swim back but also it gives them a burst of oxygenated water over the gills so they go back better if a fish are properly knackered if you know they're tired if you can see they're real lethargic they do need to be recovered either in the live bait tank or in the net The soft plastic is going to be easier to bounce around down in the bottom as well because you're less likely to snag up. When we started off this drift I put us into a little bit of a gully. Oh, all, right. all the fish were in the gully weren't they? Have a quick look. No, we're still drifting along the gully, we should be okay. By picking areas, by picking features. Let me say about a gully there. A gully through the middle of a reef. Fish will move along it just because current will move along it. Also, if there's any particles or any feed or anything, it gets deposited into gullies. And if the tide is running over the top of it, fish, like humans, are inherently lazy. If they can find an easier way of doing something, they will do. So sitting out of the current, oh, sitting out of the current, so they're not having to expend energy, they'll do it. Pulling back there, have you? Yeah, it's a little So there can be 
can be such a such a thing as too many fish in an area. Because all that bait fish, all it did was it just everything down there, it had that much choice. You land it straight into it. Do you trust me for, to, for me to say that we will get bigger ones than this? Yes. Okay. We'll put, this, we'll put this one back. Yes. We'll get some bigger ones. Just, yeah. Do you need your... Um, he has absolutely nailed it. mullered that. It is right down there. You go, it? Right. Take the hook outside the gill and then pull the trace out of its mouth. Or 15 yards and then let them sink to the bottom then give them a few bounces bring them towards me and then wind them up because as that as it swims up to the surface its tail rattles and then that's when that's when they'll strike you so i'll fish it on bottom and see if there's any any cord or rats or anything on the bottom and then as you start bringing it up to the surface that's sometimes when you pick a pollock oh, Like literally exactly what I was saying now about your chest and look. Yeah. Pollock or Russ? Pollock. Bigger or smaller? Smaller. Oh, smaller than that one. Alright. I think I have to let you win. Yeah. Sorry. I'd never bring you again if you didn't. Remember what I was saying before about the Russ eating lice? These are lice. The reason why I'm using using my Leatherman to get the treble out is all I do is I get hold of the shank of the treble and turn it because there's a second tandem hook here. If the fish thrashes, you can get one of the hooks in your hand. You found it? Yeah. Don't stop then. Fishing should get better as we get further because we're drifting from a shallow area to a deeper area.
fishing in shallow water like this as well and taking your time to bring them up. Yeah, it saves them a bit, doesn't it? Yeah. Real well, don't they? Yeah. We're going to head offshore now, so I'll get us set. When we get there, I'll talk you through the rigs and the bait up. We've made it out to the wreck. I'll tell you what, we are blessed today with the conditions. Get a little bit of a pan around so you can see. It is flat calm. Now the rigs that I'm using, if I can just squeeze past your feet please mate. The rigs that I've knocked up are just one hook wrecking rigs. We're fishing. At the moment we've got 10 ounce and 12 ounce leads on. The hooks are 10 and 12 ho meat hooks. And all I've done is I've just flapped off, flapped off one of the macro. And we're fishing them like that. Now the area where we're out to, we're out, we're out in a wreck and it is about 90 metres deep. We've, we're just before slack water so the drift is slowing right down. And what we're planning on doing is we're going to drift around and over the wreck. And hopefully tempt, tempt a ling out one of those mackerel baits. But we do have a monstrous great seal out here with us. He's, he's, his head's like a flipping basketball. Hopefully he will move somewhere else because the worst thing about that is is not only do they they can reach the bottom they can eat the fish that's in the wreck but if you're bringing a fish up he'll go down and he'll take it off your hook so yeah i'm gonna steam the boat up around the wreck and we're gonna drift over it that's the theory and we're just in amongst a little bit of snaggy stuff so if you can feel the feel the bottom look where you led so you just just dropping down so you can just touch it so you look at the bottom of your the bottom of your drop yeah so that if you get a bite you can strike all that yeah. distance oh, I'll keep sausage that seal right. yeah, the reason why you don't drag it along the bottom and then you're just kind of patting it because yeah. so if you're dragging it and you hit any of the wreck you'll drag straight into it yeah, you should feel it but as you as you reach a bit of structure as you're patting it you should feel it come up so you'll yeah. know it's really a little bit of lining the bites you get from ling they are aggressive bites they are positive bites you will know you've got one and the first 10 feet is crucial because it lives in a wreck and when you get the hook into it it wants to be out of the wreck it's right it wants to be back into the wreck you want to get it out of there so you need to be really tough on it once you've got it 10 foot 12 foot away from the wreck generally you can play it easier come on the spool next time there's a big bite strike into it got it yeah mate that's a fish Come on, like you mean it, like you mean it. Yeah. Don't play under your arm, play it to your groin. There you go. Right, keep that rod bent. The rod's not bent, keep the rod bent. There you go. Keep. Ooh. Every time you get to the top, you're, you're giving it slack. You don't want to give it any slack at all. <coughs> Slacken up. As soon as you give any slack at all, it'll be off. So you need to keep a bend in the rod at all times. We lost it. Yeah, so. By backing the boat up and by putting a set of gloves on, I have managed to free Martin up. So man's no longer snagged in the wreck. But Dan's fish there, if you just, just show your bait around to the camera. It's well and truly mashed, so it was it was a good fish. I would have, I would have said that was a that was a very big ling, and that just kind of shows there everything that we talked about. Where I kind of said the first ten feet are crucial. You need to be on top of it, not give it any slack at all. You really need to show it who's boss. And there, all that happens is as the hook's in the side of their mouth and they shake their head, the hole where the hook goes through. Every time they shake their head, it gets a little bit bigger. So as soon as you let that rod tip go straight. Hook just slips out. So we'll um, we'll get them next time. 
That seal is eating a blown ling. So what I imagine that has happened is as that fish has come off and it's not been able to get itself down to depth as quick. Because as you bring them up, you bring them up through the water column too quick, the swim bladders blow. Well as that fish had kind of got up to a depth and had started to go back down again, it's simple prey for him. So yeah, he's busy chomping away at like a, a 10 or 12 pound ling. Go away, please, Roger. People who, who comment on these things generally don't have an awful lot of, of background knowledge on them. And they talk about, oh, well, he needs to eat to live. Well, yeah, they do. But if they ate the whole fish, it wouldn't be a problem. But what they'll do is they'll eat one fish and then just go around and take bites out of everything else. Like when a fox gets into a hen house and it just, just smashes everything. They'll move along a net and eat the first fish and then take a bite out of the next 20 fish. Yeah. Come on, we want a fish this time. That, seal, that seal's got a ling in its mouth. Seal's just popped up right in front of the boat and it's got a ling in its mouth. Well, at least he got this one fair and square. There he is, look. I think he is showing us. Boy. That's indicative of small ones. And that they don't take the whole bait in their mouth, they just get hold of it. And as soon as you go to rag, spot. Rag like that, and as soon as you go and lift into it, they keep hold of the bait and you just pull the hook through it. You might have had a second chance. We have a ling. There it is. Yes. Finally. Panicking about that seal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, luckily yeah. He, he was occupied. A bit. Got one in the end. That's the rig. See if we can't do that again. Mr. Seal has emerged with yet another fish in his mouth. And uh, the only way that we've managed to find a couple of fish here is the wrecks spread out over about 300 metres. We've come to the completely opposite side, pulled a fish out and he's followed us. So we're going to have one last drop to see if we can't pluck a fish out and then we're going to go somewhere else. Did they say it? Maybe it's just a This is what I was meaning about when you get a good sized yeah, pouting. Yeah, isn't it? When you get a big pouting, they do give a big bite. Awesome. Leave the wreck to the seals. We're off back in shore. That's a nice one. Good fish. 
You might not be able to see it, but there it is. Fingers off wrong side. Fingers off wrong side. Oh, come on. Give him a, give him a six for that dive. Too much splash. Oh, hello. It stacks a little tiny pollock. Can you film one as well? No, no. The setup that I'm using, I've gone back to my, uh, my conflict tie rubber, a little fathom low profile. And this is slightly heavier. I think this is a 35 gram side rock. No, 40 gram mimic speed jig. So you're away from engine. Quick release. Just in the corner of its mouth. All or nothing in it, you're either in it. Like that. Oh, is that a fish? Yeah. Oh, don't stop the swirl, don't stop the swirl there. Oh, I've got one as well. That's quite a nice right, gentle right. Lift up. Don't wind just on the rail. Yeah. So lift up like that, wind down. When I've got small hooks, remember, so don't, don't bully it, just take it easy. I think yours is scrapping out because you've hooked it back. Oh, two better fish though. Just saying about where's the bigger fish? Where's the bigger fish and two obligers straight away? There you go. Nice. Which one's? That one's bigger. Beat me. Of course, I knew it was bigger. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was bigger. I just wanted you to see it. Yeah, every now and again, I do know what I'm doing. Very quickly, show that to there. Switched it up, a bit of a shallow water, with a shallow lure brought in up high. Nice little silver bass. It's a different day of it in here now. Yeah, the wind really did pick up. And because we had a situation of wind against tide, it got quite sloppy. We had a fantastic day. We were talking about it on the way up. I don't even remember how many fish we caught. Oh, I've, countless, I lost count. Countless Pollock. Got one bass. Oh, off yes. The train. Yeah. Yes. How can I forget? I'm really impressed with this. This is, uh, this is my tie rubber. This is a conflict tie rubber. First time I've used it with the uh, Fathom Low Profile. It was, um, <laughs> yeah. when I first grilled it with my hand, I was thinking this is really whippy. But yeah, it led straight into like a real big ball and rass and some nice pollock. This was the standard setup that you were using. This is the Conflict Inshore and it's a Slammer 4, four and a half thousand. So this is what I would use standard, but I'm gonna start using this lighter one more just because of how much fun it was. Just fishing yeah. with like that little 30 gram jig. It was, when, you're gonna, when you know you're only gonna be catching four, five, six pound fish, you might as well get yeah. the maximum fun out of them got some cleaning down and some filleting to be doing. I hope you enjoyed joining us, I hope you found it interesting. All the very best. See you later. Bye.